All right, we're, we're, we're rolling, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining. This is another episode of the OpenShift Commons Briefings Operator Hours. And today we are fortunate enough to have with us Ewout Prangshma, who is the team lead and main architect for the OASIS managed services offerings at Arango DB. Ewout, how are you today? I'm very good. Thanks for having me. How are you today? <laughs> really good, really good. I got I got some uh, I got some some final uh, ski runs in this past weekend up here in in the in the New England. The snowpack is pretty much gone. Everything's starting to shift over to spring. How's it uh, How's it over in the Netherlands? Yeah, we're actually uh, well. We don't have that much snow in the Netherlands, to be honest. But uh, definitely. That, uh, we had some earlier this year, um, but uh, spring is definitely coming. Had a very nice weather outside right now, and uh, we're trying to get more out uh, outdoors um, and making a lot of fun with it. <laughs> I've been there a couple times. Isn't that the tulip capital of the world? Uh, it definitely is. Yes, yes. So Arango DB. It's a database, I can tell by, by the name. Um, uh, what are you gonna be talking to us today about? Yeah, what we're going to talk about today is um, the challenges that we have while building our managed uh, cloud offering. Um, we are running um, uh, ArangoDB Oasis, which is our managed service. So we're running ArangoDB databases for our customers. Um, we're doing that in a multi-cloud fashion. So customers can choose um, different cloud providers. And there are lots of technical challenge behind the scenes uh, because not every cloud is the same. And we're going to talk about what actually makes the difference between cloud, uh, the different cloud vendors and how we overcome that. Sure, sure. You, you wanna pop up that first slide that we were talking about earlier? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. And, thank, and thanks again for uh, for being part of our show. You know, we 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 host all of our software partners who we work with, who build a operator for OpenShift and Arango DB is 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 another database vendor that we're proud to have been uh, able to see supporting our platform for their database. I got to ask you a question. I, I, your your logo seems to be an avocado for the company, and I know when we were talking previously that um, you know o Oasis is is a is a managed offering as opposed to just the database, and it has its own mark. Is that an avocado growing a leaf leafy tree out of it? What what's in your mark there? Yeah, so um, there, there is a story behind here. So um, you're right, the OrangoDB logo itself is an avocado. Um, and for Oasis, we wanted to uh, merge that with the cloud. Um, and obviously when you call your product an Oasis, uh, we also want to have customers have the Oasis feeling. They, we want them to uh, feel that we got their back and they can just relax in a very nice place and actually work with the database and let the worrying do to us. So what we did is we merged the typical cloud image uh, with the pit of the avocado. So the brown dot in um, the Oasis logo is actually the pit of the avocado surrounded by the palm trees of the Oasis. That's pretty cool. Uh, so you're you're uh, you're about seven years old. I think you've been with the company for about five of those years. Um, what kind of changes have you seen in the company over the five years that, that you've been there? Is it is it is it growing? Is is it you know how how is the how's the state of the union over at Arango DB? Yeah, we are growing uh, very much at the moment, and we're growing in the whole lots of different areas. So um, over time. We have grown from a database that people uh, really get to love and, and use for all kinds of different purposes, uh, primarily um, documents, graphs, uh, nowadays also graph analysis. Um, and we see that growth in our customers. We are getting many, many, many more customers nowadays. When I started, it was still a few, but 
We now have very large customers um, and we can also see that the actual use cases of our customers are changing. Um, so it's not only uh, small use cases here and there, but we can see that very large customers are relying on us um, to store their biggest graphs um, that scale many, many different machines um, to solve all kinds of uh, problems in either IoT or medicine or uh, social networking or anything like that. And you folks are, I'm going to guess you're a fairly distributed company. You, I know that, that you're in the Netherlands. Is that is that where the company started in the Netherlands or was it? No, in the, the company actually started in Germany. Um, it started out in Cologne, um, which is in the west part of, of Germany, um, actually not that far from, uh, from where I live. Um, but nowadays we are a really distributed company. Um, so we range all the way from Asia um, uh, to Russia, uh, many countries in the EU, um, the US. Um, so I don't think that we're um, having people in Australia at the moment, but mm, we may get there as well. Yeah, and, Cologne, yeah, like, right? like, like, like most companies in, in the last year, we have transitioned from a distributed office-based company into a fully distributed company where um, everyone has uh, their private office, essentially. Right. I mean, I work at Red Hat and we're, we're, you know, we're owned by IBM now. And I think we, there's collectively in the company, there's probably 370,000 employees and everybody is doing this. Everybody is working yeah. from home. It's certainly, yeah. it's certainly been an interesting 12 months and uh, hopefully Hopefully, at some point here soon, we'll, everyone will get vaccinated and we'll be able to get back to, uh, you know, the yeah, that would at, least, at least partially, awesome. you know, at least partially the old the old ways um, of at least going out and going to KubeCon, right? I mean, we were we were yeah. we were scheduled to go to KubeCon. Uh, when where was it going to be in in Amsterdam, right? Yeah, and that was that was really kind of a bummer that that right back then there last March everything got canceled, but. Oh well. Um, yeah, I think that we're all trying to uh, to cope with this, but actually, for the database market, the the last year has actually also seen a lot of upticks because with all the more digitalization of products, um, people are needing a way to store all their business, um, and they're doing that in databases. So for us, it's actually um, also a positive side to the whole story. So we, you know. I, I do partner marketing with you know vendors here at Red Hat that support OpenShift and and you know there's got to be probably 15 different database vendors that I work with from a marketing perspective on a on a regular basis. Um, why are there so many? Yeah, well, um, that's always a very good question. Um, I think that there are so many because um, the use cases vary and the technology uh, varies over time. Um, so we have seen in the database world a natural progression from um, storing um, very fact fixed uh, rows of data um, and slowly migrated to more NoSQL because people found that this, having a very fixed structure is not very pleasant. And um, more recently, uh, there has been a large shift towards graph databases and uh, analysis of graphs data, uh, the data being stored in graphs. Um, sure. And what, what ArangoDB specializes in, the special place that we have in there is um, that we're not only doing uh, documents and graphs, but we're also doing that at a very, very large scale. Um, so you're not limited to single machines. If you have a data set that needs many machines, you can still do it, and you can still have very performant graph uh, traversals. <coughs> so there's 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 your graph database. There's there's uh, SQL databases, no SQL databases, new SQL databases. Um, what's the difference between graph data? Are, are how how does a graph database compare with SQL, NoSQL, and so forth and so forth? Yeah, I think in the, um, the it's not so much how you store the data; uh, it's more about what you can do with querying the data. Um, there are more and more 
use cases out there where you are thinking of a graph in your um, storage space. Um, that can be as simple as the traditional social network example where you have people and you people have connections between them and you post uh, uh, blogs and there are comments on that. And all of that can be thought of as a huge graph. Um, while you can do that for a social network, it's pretty obvious, but think in the world of IoT, for example. Um, there you also have lots of different interconnections. So you are talking about objects like houses um, and sensors and actuators and all kinds of um, devices in there. And all of that can be thought of as a huge graph because there are lots of connections between them. Um, where the graph database uh, really shines is in um, asking questions about such a graph. Um, let me give you an example. If I want to um, go uh, ask in my social network, um, give me all the people that recently commented on a uh, blog post um, that a, a friend of you uh, wrote, um, then if you want to think of how you could write that, um, if you have to do all these lookups with a traditional SQL-like joining approach, um, you would first of all have to think of the, all of that up front um, and it may, needs a lot of interaction with your database. So also on a technical level, that means a lot of programming, but it also means a lot in performance. Um, with the graph database um, and the graph query language behind it, you can ask that entire question in one go to the database and let the database solve the problem for you. And it will just go through all the data that it has um, and give you back the answer. And where OrangaDB is really special that it can give you that, uh, that answer very quickly also if your data um, becomes very large. So we're, we're streaming this live on Twitch and it's also live on um, YouTube as well as Facebook. People watching this right now will be able to put questions into their, into their chats and they're going to pop up over here and our, our producer, Chris, is making sure that that's happening. Are you saying that, that a comment that someone made on YouTube, if, and I don't know what their backend system is, but you can then actually use their backend data store to run you know, reports and, and, and graph that up? No, it's not so much that we are using uh, their store or that we can combine that, but if you model your uh, data as a graph and store that in a graph database, um, then you can ease the amount of queries that you can do and make it much more performant in the, in the process. Okay. Okay. And and then so the, so the types of workloads that customers choose to use for your database, what, how would you characterize those? Is, is it financial transactions on Wall Street? Is it, is it, is it Twitter tweets? What, what, uh, how is it used? Yeah, that's, that, that's the beauty of this. Um, it's not limited to a single use case. And um, a, a lazy answer, answer would be all of the above. Um, but to, to give you a couple of examples, we span all the way from, um, uh, tracking uh, aircraft parts um, to IoT applications um, to utilities uh, to medicine. Um, just imagine what the uh, COVID crisis and all the research around that is doing. And you could even think of uh, all the resource papers being written around uh, COVID and spin that up in a huge graph. And, um, that way advance uh, the, the science behind it and um, come up quicker with answers uh, to this whole pandemic. I, I, was, I was just making a note here. Actually, I still am. Maybe I should stop making a note and look at you. Uh, my mom always said to make sure you look at people when you're talking to them, so all right. Um, so, you know, these challenging times that, that people refer to, to it as, what kind of impact has that had on your business? Yeah, I think it has uh, twofold. Uh, one, um, we have learned to be 100% remote. Um, we were already a distributed company with people in many countries as we discussed. Um, but I think like any other business, we have learned um, 
that yes, you cannot just take the plane and go to your customer. You have to talk to them over Zoom or whatever medium uh, you use. Um, <clears throat> and also in the way that we work internally with our engineering, with our sales, how do you coordinate that? Um, I think that's that's change number one. And the other change, of course, is um, uh, our customers. Um, our customers are also going uh, digital um, in a very high pace. Um, it's going like crazy. And they are storing data. And what we see more and more, and that's definitely a, a change of the last year, is um, since the customer also doesn't have easy access to their offices, um, they're also store more and more moving their data into the cloud. Um, and that is also where Orangadib Oasis then uh, pops up because we see more and more customers choosing our managed service because the, they already reason I cannot go to my servers in my office, so why not make the switch to the cloud and store everything in Oasis and not manage it ourselves? You know, like 18 months ago, people were saying, well, you know, the cloud is still is a lot of hype and workloads are still going to be continued to work, you know, run it, run in a data center and so forth on bare metal on premise. So you're saying that that because of the, you know, the present situation that we have, that's accelerating customers to get on the stick and, and improve accessibility to the data by moving everything into the cloud. Or, yeah, absolutely. Or, or moving absolutely. things faster into the cloud than, say, their plans may have been 12 to 18 months ago. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, good. So why don't I turn it over to you here and um, and uh, let's let's learn about your your title slide here and and see what you got for us. Very good. Okay. So um, let's dive into this uh, multi-cloud provider platform that Oasis is. And um, we're here uh, also on the invitation of the guys behind OpenShift. So obviously we're talking about Kubernetes uh, and everything uh, around there. Um, and let me start by saying that um, not every Kubernetes is actually the same. And although people may think that way, and uh, I would love it to be true, um, we found in our um, endeavor to build this Oasis platform that it is not really true, and the devil is in the detail. Um, and what I uh, propose or, or will discuss today is um, some of these challenges that we have, and I will give you some examples of um, where things can actually make a difference between different Kubernetes uh, offerings. So the thing that we're going to talk about is um, what kind of challenges you have when you're doing multiple uh, provider support. Um, and we're also going to talk about Kubernetes as an abstraction layer. Um, but not every abstraction layer is perfect. Um, and we're going to dive into the differences and um, those differences are in lots of areas. The typical traditional ones like security, but also networking and obviously for a database storage. Um, then there are lots of other things around here um, that we can dive into as well, but um, we will just hit the surface of this one. So a little bit of introduction about myself. Um, uh, we already discussed, um, I'm team lead of the AramaDB Oasis uh, product. Um, and I always like to work on distributed systems and actually make things work for customers. Um, that's my main motivation and that's my main driver and that's what we're doing. And if you see a model train in the background, then you've spotted it right. That's my passion behind it. Um, that, wait a minute, wait, that, that's not a real picture? That, that's like in no, your living no, no, room no, somewhere? No, 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 this is actually a 187 scale model train. Oh, interesting. I thought that was part of the countryside there. In, no, in, no, 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 no. Unfortunately, the Netherlands is much more flat than this. So this is not something I know. that you'll find in the Netherlands. I, I've been there a couple of times for, for DockerCon, KubeCon. It was amazing how flat it was and that, you know, the everyone used their bicycles like crazy. It was really cool. Which you can do if it's flat, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, obviously there is also a much bigger team, so we are just some names and, and faces of my, uh, my teammates. Um, a little bit uh, of an intro of RangoDB itself. 
Um, so we already discussed it's a graph database, um, but you can go much further than graphs. You can also store documents even as raw as uh, key values. Um, the key part here is scalable. Um, you can have very large graphs and we give you all kinds of tools um, to make it easy to not only scale that data, but to make it still performant. Uh, and that's very important. And all of that data, whether it is your graphs or your documents, all of that can be queried with a single query line. Um, that's pretty important uh, for our customers because imagine that you would have to learn three, four or five different query languages for each of them. It will be really annoying. This way you can just learn one thing and you know it very well and you can apply it to everything. So let's move on to our RongoDB Oasis, our managed platform. So what do we do? Um, we have, um, in, in the history of RongoDB, we have spoken with lots of customers and we get a lot of comments saying us, um, I really like your database, it's easy to use, it's great, but please run it for me. I don't like running this database. And that actually makes a lot of sense because running a database uh, or any stateful uh, load, but definitely a database is not an easy thing to do. You have to look at all the details and you have to get all of the details right, otherwise you have problems. Um, and that's exactly what we help our customers with. So we run databases for them. So we run, a uh, customer comes to us and say, I want to run an OrangoDB database in, for example, Google um, in, uh, in London, or I want to run it in AWS in Ohio. And we make sure that that database is um, started there, um, but also we make sure that it keeps running there and we monitor it and we make sure all the backups are in place and all that stuff. Let, um, let me, can I ask you a question? Yeah, so, go ahead. You know, there's this concept of, you know, if you're using, you know, some Kubernetes platform like OpenShift or others that you can build it once and deploy anywhere. Yes. Is, that, that's, that, that's not the case with GKE AWS because they're, they're all different enough that it's almost like having to support multiple different platforms for the same application. Yeah, yes and no. Um, you can go as far as to say, I can run it uh, on all different platforms. And as long as you don't care about optimal performance or you don't care about optimal security, um, then you get pretty close to deploying and running it everywhere. Um, if you do care about all of these things, and I think most people actually do, then there are all kinds of small variations. Um, and let me let me dive into those. Um, because we see Kubernetes as an abstraction layer, and I often make the comparison of the Kubernetes and the promise of the Java virtual machine as we had it in the 90s. Um, that promise was also one, yeah, you can write once and then, uh, run it everywhere, um, but the reality, and I've written my fair share of Java in the past as well, um, was that you were also um, tweaking like, okay, what platform am I running on and I need to adjust for that platform. Um, small things, you don't have to rewrite everything, but you still have to deal with it. Kubernetes nowadays is the same story. Uh, we look at Kubernetes, in this case, managed Kubernetes, um, and we look at three cloud providers that provide managed Kubernetes offerings. Obviously, we're also available on-prem. Um, if you're running OpenShift, um, you can use also the um, ArangoDB operator uh, to run an ArangoDB database by yourself, but that's not Oasis. Um, for Oasis, we're running on these managed Kubernetes offerings. Um, one for uh, Amazon, EKS, you have GKE for Google and you have AKS for Microsoft Azure. Um, and you could argue, hey, they're all Kubernetes. They're all, we have a, a series of containers that we need to run. What is the difference? Well, let me um, see, tell you the areas where the differences are. Um, there are many. Um, let's talk about Kubernetes versions. They're slightly different. Um, let's talk about security and authentication. If you want to authenticate, yourself um, with a Kubernetes cluster running on Amazon, so it's completely different uh, and you need different tooling. 
um, then an authentication on uh, GKE. And of course, you can use the same kubectl tooling to do it, but underneath, you need to install additional tools for it. Um, and there are lots of different areas. And what I would like to give you a couple of highlights of the differences on the different platforms. So let's talk Amazon. Amazon is actually, it's a very stable platform. That's awesome. Um, but it has many resources that you need if you're creating a Kubernetes cluster. It's not as easy as to say, yeah, I'm spinning it up and just create me a cluster. No, you have to bring in your load balancers and your security groups and lots of stuff. Um, that makes it challenging. Um, it also makes it easier to control once you have done it, but it takes a huge step to get there. Um, and what we find is that everything that you do on Amazon is working really well, but the error handling is a bit outdated, unfortunately. Um, it's not really structured, and sometimes you have to resort to things like string parsing and so on. Um, if we switch to GKE, um, the APIs of GKE are awesome. You can just spin up and the Kubernetes cluster like that, and it's extremely easy to do. Um, but the big problem that we have with GKE is their very aggressive update policy. Um, they are just forcing you to go to new uh, Kubernetes versions on a relentless pace. Um, and if you're on a managed platform, you have to follow. Um, there is no choice. Um, Can I ask you a question? If you're doing something that? stateful, <laughs> Um, so, like we do, you have to be extra careful there. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's just, you know, having been here at Red Hat for, whatever, 21 years now, I was here when, you know, Red Hat Linux was a very popular distribution, version 6, version 7, version 8, and our, our um, update cycle was really fast. And when we started creating our enterprise product, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Well, the first version was actually called Advanced Server 2.1, but that's, people probably don't remember that. Um, we we did that because our customers told us that they wanted a stable platform for three to five years, so they didn't have to keep revving their apps all the time. Yep. Is that kind of where we are now? I mean, wouldn't is, wouldn't that be a major problem for people trying to build apps for GKE? If if they're like, what is what is their release cycle on their their platform? Yeah, it it, it is really a problem at the moment, um, and it is how they deal with it. Um, the the general release cycle for Kubernetes is uh, roughly every three months there is a new uh, minor version uh, which changes uh, things. Um, the amount of versions that you can have that you can choose from on GKE is fairly short. Um, which means that they have this uh, window of versions that you can be in, but that window is rather small. Um, so it also means that you're quickly out of that window. Um, so you really have to think that on GKE, um, you are go going to a new version at least every two months. Um, and that's rather a lot. Does that mean people have to do a rebuild every two months of their apps? No, it's usually not a rebuild. Um, but when you are uh, doing things at the scale and trying to get the max out of it of your stateful um, uh, payload, um, then you have to be careful uh, because new versions of Kubernetes um, also bring with it um, new features, which is great, but also dep deprecation of features and uh, more stringent um, security requirements, for example. Um, and you have to be very careful that uh, an upgrade to that new version is not going to break your system. Um, so the majority of the updates that we do in terms of Kubernetes versions are more of a test and deploy kind of approach, um, but there are definitely also issues. Um, usually in every minor versions, there are two or three issues uh, that really need changes in our code to uh, be effective on the new version. So if I'm a developer building applications and I don't really want to put all all eggs in one basket, right? Because we don't want to get you know locked into one particular cloud vendor. Presumably, people building apps, you know, publish them on Amazon, GKE, Azure, and others. But if 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 everyone's revving their 
base platform every several months, as you mentioned that with GKE, and I don't know what the release cycle is for Amazon or Azure. How does an application developer deal with that when they're, you'd think that instead of creating new features, they're just sitting there having to, you know, cater to the update path of the three cloud providers there? Yeah, that's, um, I, I must add here that the majority of things um, that uh, require changes uh, have to do with stateful workloads. Um, and the majority of applications doesn't have that much state in it. Um, that's what you use a database for. Um, so the majority of applications are not going to have that much problems um, when their underlying Kubernetes version is upgraded. Um, it becomes a problem if you're doing more uh, stateful things, or are you more heavily integrated in the network, for example? If you're on the edge of um, the requirements of the network um, in terms of your security or your firewalling and so things like that, um, yeah, then you have to be careful and then you have to go with the flow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's switch over to, uh, to Microsoft Azure. We haven't touched those. Um, we can see um, that it is clearly uh, the least mature of the three, um, but they are very responsive um, in, in their support. We have had great support from them. Um, the biggest problem that we have is really on the storage side uh, with, with Microsoft Azure. Um, it has to do with uh, the um, attachment of persistent volumes and resizing of persistent volume claims and so on. Um, and also, um, there is a weird behavior of the cluster autoscaler on Microsoft Azure. Um, so the cluster autoscaler, um, make sure that your cluster actually grows when the workloads on your cluster grow. Um, and for us, that is a very useful feature, uh, because as soon as a customer says, I want to run this deployment there, um, we make sure that the nodes are there and that all the available the resources are there. Um, but that's not something that we do ourselves. We only say we want to have this capacity there and the cluster autoscaler is going to make it happen. Um, if you look on Microsoft Azure, the cluster autoscaler um, is not that smart with dealing with zones. Um, and that's for us a problem. Uh, we want to go cross availability zones um, because of the high availability guarantees that we give. Um, but what the autoscaler for uh, Azure is actually doing is it just saying, I'm creating your next node in the next region. So first you get a node in zone A and then in zone B and then in zone C. But it doesn't take into account if you have a certain affinity with your node. And if you have data um, that lives in zone two, um, and suddenly the node is out of scaler is going to make something in zone three, it's not very helpful. So there are lots of issues there. Um, I want to pick one here. Um, we can go through the entire list, but let's talk about storage because storage, of course, is a, a very big issue for a database uh, vendor. So where are these differences then? Um, let's start with uh, performance. Um, there is a big difference in how performant the different persistent volume offerings are. Um, and all of them have different options for configuring and you can choose, of course, your SSDs and your uh, IOPS settings and so on. As soon as you go in that direction, it becomes provider specific. Um, so getting back to your uh, previous question of, yeah, where is actually the difference and can't I just run it anywhere? Yeah. Technically, you can, um, but if you want to have a volume with certain characteristics, you have to specify it for that platform. That's not something that Kubernetes is going to give you. Um, and also, the characteristics of the performance over time are changing. Um, the majority of providers have an, an interesting feature that they essentially give you a buffer of uh, IOPS, so those are the IO operations that you can do per time, uh, per unit of time. Um, and if you exceed that buffer, um, the majority of providers is a bit lenient and say, yeah, okay, I'm going to, it's fine, you can do it, uh, but not for a long time. So you don't have a sustained 
uh, performance characteristic there, and that changes over time. And it makes it different to compare uh, the performance of AWS against the performance of Google, for example. Um, let's talk about volume resizing. Um, volume resizing is something that is specified in um, Kubernetes. You can just um, create a resizing resource of your persistent volume claim, and according to the Kubernetes specification, it's going to resize. Um, but it's not really done exactly in the same way. Um, and that makes it hard. So we have had to build in um, additional code specifically for Microsoft Azure um, because of the way that the attachment of volumes works. Um, the rest of the providers can change the volumes on the fly, don't have a problem with that, and here it doesn't. This is one of these cases um, where the specification of Kubernetes is not going to help you because it doesn't say everything that there is to say about the actual underlying behavior. And this is exactly the behavior that we saw in the 90s with the JVM, um, where, yeah, the specification says it's the same, but the reality is slightly different. The big question, of course, we are at right now already um, well into 2021, and do we see an improvement there? Because we have been working on the Oasis platform for two and a half years. Two and a half years is pretty much a lifetime uh, in Kubernetes uh, world. Um, so will it get any better? Um, and I'm afraid not. Um, this is just a picture of container runtimes that we see. Um, of course, not all of them are available on the managed platforms, but there are a huge option, a huge amount of options to choose from. Um, and we see the whole Kubernetes sp uh, space is evolving in a very rapid pace. Uh, there are lots of exciting projects uh, popping up, but there are also uh, deviations, uh, all with their specific good and bad. Um, but overall, it probably means more work for the multi-provider uh, platform. Awat, do you, do you think, just go back to that last one for a second. Of course. Do you think the world needs so many container runtimes? It's always a very challenging question to answer. Uh, my personal uh, answer to that would be no, um, but let's be honest. Um, there are also um, a huge amount of different cars in the world. Do we need so many different cars? People also have a preference. And I think in this case, that's also the case. Um, so there are preferences. Um, there are real benefits of all of them. Um, so there is always a use case where one fits better than the other. Okay. Who is it? You, you made the uh, Scott McCarty from our company once, and I can quote him, he was talking about um, our platform is, uh, because there are so many different types of vehicles and each one is, is multi, you know, is purposed for a different thing. That he, what did he say? He said, uh, OpenShift is a, is a dump truck that can carry 28 yards of dirt and go 200 miles an hour and handle really well. Um, yeah. I thought that was I thought that was kind of cool. Anyways, throw out throw that out for Scott. Yeah. Oh, um, obviously there are many more different areas uh, that we can discuss, um, and uh, but there are lots of different um, issues that we are dealing with, like logging, like networking. Um, but um, I just didn't want to go into all the details right now. Sure. <clears throat> of course, I have to um, I invite everyone to take Oasis for a test drive. Um, you can try out Oasis for free um, and um, go to orangadb.com. There is a big button there um, where you can try it out and you can just uh, have fun with it. learn the OrangoDB product. Um, you don't have to do anything yourselves, um, just spin it up um, and have fun with it. And if you like it, enter your credit card and continue with it. Okay. Thanks so for that. Do I get, you, I get a, do you have any questions in the chat? I don't see any questions in the, in the chat. I, I had a couple other questions here for you. Sure, um, go ahead. I just wanted to make sure you could run, you could get your, your, your slide content in. 
Um, you know, how do you guys see customers doing things differently now than four years ago, for example? I mean, I, I know that I know that you said that you know people are moving people are moving workloads into the cloud faster than ever, and it's in part been brought on by the you know the the pandemic and so forth. But you know, but what 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 are they actually doing differently now than they were four years ago from a data management perspective? Yeah, um, let's start with the way that they deploy. Um, that's a very a very prominent uh, difference over the last couple of years. If you were looking at it four years ago, everyone was running their database um, by installing some package, some Linux package uh, on their servers, um, running everything in, I don't know, something like system D uh, container or, or scripts um, and hooking up virtual machines. Um, nowadays, um, pretty much the far majority of our customers is running their database in a Kubernetes environment. Um, so whether they are doing that on Oasis, where we're running things in Kubernetes, or whether they're running it by themselves on-prem using our Kubernetes operator, um, they are using Kubernetes. Um, that is a huge shift. Um, and it also, it changes everything from the way that we distribute our product, um, to the way that how we can support our customers, how you get logs and so on. That has been a tremendous shift. Okay, and where and where do you see it in 18 months from now? I mean, are we done? Is, is this it? Are we there? Has, has the Eagle landed? Well, um, depends on, on how you are looking at that. I think that um, in 18 months, um, the shift towards Kubernetes I'm not saying it will be complete because there will always be companies that don't uh, jump on that bandwagon, um, but it will be uh, pretty much all over the place. I think what is really changing uh, nowadays is um, two aspects of the story. One is scale, um, and the other is what they're actually doing with it. Um, let me start with the scale aspect, um, where even, one and a half years ago, you could see uh, graphs um, that were spun up with some uh, tens of thousands of nodes. Um, now we're seeing graphs with millions and hundreds of millions and billions of nodes uh, coming. And in order to fit all of that, it absolutely no longer fits on a single machine. You need many machines and we're uh, easily um, cross the um, number of nodes what we even didn't think of a couple of years ago. Um, that trend is um, going to continue uh, very fast um, in, in the future. Um, the other thing is what they're actually doing with it, um, because you don't only want to uh, store your graph uh, data um, and query for it. We're seeing a trend towards more um, analysis of the data. So. There is a lot of things that you can do, and then you're touching again things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and doing that in combination with graph data is a new area um, that is popping up like crazy. I was going to say, you know, everyone's talking about AI and machine learning. Yeah. You know, that for that workload, there must be a huge dependency on on the, on the data stores, right? Yes, that's true, yep. and and it it's not only uh, how you store it, but also how do you model it, model it, for example. Because if you have, if you think of your traditional machine learning like just simple vectors of numbers and and do some um, uh, magic with that, how do you map your graph data set into something that can be understood by the machine learning algorithms that we already know? <clears throat> um, that challenge alone is a very interesting one. Can't they just use Oracle for that? Um, yeah, you could, uh, but why would you? Um, it's pretty much the same question as uh, if you're standing in front of a very nice BMW, um, can't you go by horse? And yeah, you could, but there are so many more options that you have nowadays 
um, that I would prefer the BMW over the horse, to be honest. Okay. Um, so, from a marketing perspective, you you know I'm not sure where who's who uh, where your your CMO lives, but there's probably some things that your marketing team would like you to make sure that you put out here so that it negates that phone call five minutes after we're done where he or she says, you know, geez, you were live on the internet. Why didn't you, why didn't you talk about X, Y, and Z? What would those, what would those things be besides go here and, and try the database? Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the part, the message that we're trying to get across is um, make sure that you uh, can actually model your data, you can store it, you can scale it, um, and get your query stuff uh, done with it. Um, get the actual value out of your data. Um, that's really key. Um, and what is the best way to get that done? Um, you can choose all kinds of databases to store your data, um, but in the end, um, modeling your data as close to your natural use case as you can make it um, and think of it in that way um, gives you the quickest and uh, uh, most prominent answer to your use case. Okay, and so what, where can people come find you folks? Like. You know, are, are you do you have are you putting on uh, you know a, a user conference or what 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 what's going on? Yeah, the, the the best way to get in touch with us is uh, through our website, through our community Slack channel. Uh, we are very active there, and we have a large uh, community of active uh, AranguDB users there as well. So there are always uh, people both from inside but also from outside the company happy to help you out there. Um, and I think it's really key to experience uh, the OrangoDB product for yourself. Um, you can, of course, do that with Oasis. You can do that as simple as running a Docker container and playing with it. Um, but make sure that you start learning uh, it. We have a lot of um, great examples um, in uh, both on our website, also on Oasis. Um, for example, if you want to learn about how you could do fraud detection with a graph database. Uh, we have a great example on Oasis how you could do that. Um, and we tell you all the interesting queries that you can run against that and start playing that with that data. So that's, that's something that we uh, have seen in the past that if you want to try out a database, what can you do without data? Um, not that much. Um, and with the examples that we can now give you, um, you can just get started right away, start playing with it. On the okay. um, more graph analytics uh, side, uh, we also have in there links on uh, our website for that. We also have a lot of uh, great notebooks that you can uh, play with interactively. Um, so if you're more on the um, AI machine learning side of the story, and want to start exploring how to model your graph data for machine learning. We have a lot of uh, notebooks. Um, you can interactively run them. They even integrate with Oasis if you want. Um, and just play around with the story, how do I map my data into something um, that my machine learning uh, can work with? And then, of course, visualize the output again. Cool. Uh, are we going to see you folks in Las Vegas? I mean, not Las Vegas, La Los Angeles. The the next KubeCon that's that's coming up is looking like it's hopefully going to be in person in in the fall. Are you folks going to be there? Uh, we're definitely, if if possible, we're definitely going to send people over there. Um, and right now, the big question, of course, is is it going to be possible? Nobody knows that right now. Um, but we are trying to get back to, uh, let's say, the normal routine of doing conferences uh, and appearances all over the place. Um, because let's be honest, it's also just a lot of fun to interact with all the customers and all the uh, prospects out there. Right. Okay, well, this, this wraps up another edition of the OpenShift Commons Briefings Operator Hours. Today we had Arut Prangshma, the main architect and team lead for the Oasis 
services from Arango DB. Um, Awu, thank you so much for joining us here today. Yeah, thanks for having me and um, good luck with the show. <laughs> All right, appreciate it. Okay.